to down Try to keep me down But I'll put the flame out You can't get to me Throw your sticks and your stones Go break all of my bones You won't ache my soul You can't get to me And there is no All right, welcome everybody, listeners, to the seventh episode of the Law of Liberty podcast. I'm Dave with my co-host Stratty as always, and today is our lucky number seven because we have with us Mr. Stefan Kinsella. Stefan is a patent attorney and the undisputed heavyweight champion of liberty. <laughs> Stefan, thank you so much for taking the time today. Uh, we really, really appreciate it, and it's an honor to finally meet you. Glad to do it. We hope we're not uh, some disrespectful punks. You know, we're very grateful. <laughs> so you guys, saw, you guys saw the Twitter stuff. You know, that's oh, my that's my Michael Malice inspired filter. You know, that's my mechanism. It's like, listen, I know how this is gonna go if you ask me a question, and if you're not really serious, uh, you know, then yeah. let me go in and cut cut to the chase. Yeah. Uh, you know, so that's kind of my 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 filter. You know. Well, that guy, that guy in particular, I didn't read the entire thread, but he was he was spouting some, you know, objectivist IP stuff. And I think even after even after that was over and you had kind of left, he was talking about like how he'd be fine with a one world government and other kind of stuff. So I think <laughs> yeah, he yeah, was... yeah, yeah. One, <laughs> one thing leads to the other. They're all tied together. Look, I'm always willing to talk to anyone who has an honest, sincere, serious question, but. It's like, come on, guy, don't just throw questions at me and um, assume things because, I mean, twi Twitter Twitter, and even Facebook are hard enough to have a rational discussion on because it's such a limited format, you know. So if you really are serious, uh, you know, ask a question or talk about something, make a coherent point, give an argument for it, and that's fine, and then you can have a coherent discussion. Um, but if you have a punk attitude and you really have a, um, you have a predisposed idea with no backing for it and you're just going to stick with it no matter what, then what's the point? You don't want to be educated and you're not going to educate anyone. So what's the point? You know, right. I guess that's how I look at it. Yeah, definitely. And we kind of talked about it before how Twitter is just kind of not the best platform for, for deep intellectual discussions. No, 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 it's not. But it's good for getting news and yeah. for getting um, nuggets from people. And if someone says, okay, look, if you want to learn more, here's a link to something else. But they never do it. I've noticed this among the modern young libertarian movement. Like they don't really – they never read. And then they'll criticize you like, oh, you just gave me a barrage of links. It's like, well <laughs> – <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Cut and pay, copy and paste right. for you? It's like I get these people that email me all the time. I, I've been in this movement for you know thirty years now and been kind of uh, prominent enough to start getting contacts for like fifteen. And people will just email you out of the blue. Hey, Mr. Kinsella, could you tell me like what to read on A, B, and C? And you know what? If that's a polite question. I'll usually take the time to give them an answer, but half the time I'm thinking, you know, there is Google. I mean, this yeah. is not that hard. <laughs> I don't really understand why you couldn't find this without emailing me first, but some people, anyway, total distraction from whatever you guys want to talk about, but, uh, Oh, no worries. We we enjoy just talking in general, but I know David has a lot of things that he wants to talk to you about specifically regarding law. So David, how about you take that away? Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, I got a lot of questions. We may or may not get to all of them. Um, but the first, the first topic I wanted to bring up was, uh, I want to talk a little bit about argumentation ethics because okay. we, we did a, we did an episode where we talked about it. Um, I think it was our third episode, which was about 
three or four weeks ago now. Um, and I was looking back over the uh, the talk you did with with Bob Murphy about a year ago, where you where you talked about that, and you said a lot of really interesting things in that 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 really got me thinking more about it. And I first heard about argumentation I think maybe about four years ago I think, and I was really I was really captivated by it. I really liked the argument. Um, so when you were on Burning Boots, I asked Derek. Um, to ask you about the relationship of argumentation ethics to natural rights. Um, and after I heard your answer on that, I realized that one of the questions I had was a little bit more specific than that. And it was more about how argumentation ethics relates to the is ought dichotomy. And so I'd like to, to, if I could just take a minute to kind of explain some of the thoughts I've been having on that, and then I can turn it over to you and see what you think. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the is ought dichotomy was, was made by Hume, who was an empiricist, and, um, and I've heard that you, uh, you know, kind of accept, accept that is ought dichotomy, and I remember seeing a quote by Hoppe, I think, where he talks about how he accepts that, and I think even Mises, well, I read Human Action last summer, and it seems like he even kind of accepts it, which is why he kind of takes the consequentialist route in, in his kind of ethical views, but my thought was, I, I kind of, I'm having a hard time seeing how argumentation ethics is, is kind of sidestepping or not directly taking on the is-ought dichotomy, because the way I've heard you ex describe it and Hoppe describe it, you're talking about, okay, you know, we live in a world of scarcity, our nature as arguers, all that kind of stuff. So it kind of seems to me like there are these kind of, you know, these factual is things that are being laid out before you reach the conclusion. And also one of the things I thought was like the epistemology side of it was because, you know, Mises and Hoppe and, you know, they take that method methodological dualism. So they're not empiricists like Hume, that there's a causal realm and the teleological realm. And so my thought was Hoppe, Hoppe talks about the praxeological presuppositions of argumentation and the way I understand it is that praxeology is an is because human beings act. It's a fact that human beings act and we deduce. And the same thing with the axiom of argumentation. So it seems to me that it, the way I've kind of been seeing it is it seems to me that it is kind of going from is to ought because Hume couldn't do the is to ought because he was an empiricist. But if you have the methodological dualism then you're taking that praxeological is and then getting those oughts from it because you can't you can't argue against the praxeological presuppositions of argumentation without contradicting yourself and contradictions can't be valid so that so is there something i'm not understanding is there something i'm overlooking or do you think this train of thought might be onto something because it kind of seems to me that it is kind of going from is to ought what do you what's your response <coughs> I mean, I think what the way you just described it is r roughly the way I think about it. So I think it's basically correct. Um, um, it seems to me that so yeah, I think you're right that Hume was an empiricist, although Hume was brilliant and he he had lots of uh, uh, insights and innovations that um, are very profound. Even though he was, um, I mean, we have to remember a lot of these people. From you know, everyone stands on the shoulders of giants, and so you, you know, if someone makes a mistake, you know, like I criticize Locke. I don't criticize Locke himself, but I think Locke is wrong in the way he interpreted some of his theories, which led to the labor theory of property, and then the labor theory of value, and then intellectual property and communism and all that. I don't blame him for that, but I'm, it's just like tracing out the way ideas work, and you know. He was dealing with, with what he was dealing with at the time. Um, so I don't really blame Hume for his flaws, but um, I do think his argument for the is odd gap makes sense. So I agree with Hoppe's, I think, endorsement of it. So he basically, it's just, it's a common sense insight that the is odd gap is logically unbridgeable. Like that's how Hoppe would put it. You you can't logically go from an is to an ought. You can't say factually this is the case, 
and therefore this is what we should or ought to do because you have to introduce a norm to go from one to the other and i think that's actually true now i do think that um I was just talking on online with Roger Long the other day about this, who's an Aristotelian, and he has this – now, he's been a critic of Hoppe's argumentation ethics, which I can get into in a second, but um, he has this Arist Aristotelian version, which is – he tries to sidestep the is-ought problem with what he calls the assertoric hypothetical. Okay, so that means that – so like if you take the Kantian framework, which is that – there are some categorical statements like you should do this no matter what, right? But where do you get that from? Or if then, like if you believe in this, like that's a hypothetical. If you believe in the value of life and if you understand economics, then you should favor a free market system, right? Something like that, which is the consequentialist kind of approach, uh, which I think makes rough sense actually. Um, but the problem is – the if is always um, um, you can never get under the if, like the positive statement. I mean, even Ayn Rand, who was kind of an Aristotelian, recognized this in her entire theory of morality and ethics and rights when she said that it all rests upon the choice to live. But she, when she was pressed, like. Uh, so if all morality is based upon the choice to live, like, quote, as a man, like the Aristotelian phrase, um, does that mean that um, you should choose to live as a man or you should choose to live? And she she basically conceded, I believe, that you could never say that it's immoral or to, like, commit suicide because, you know… All morals rest upon the choice to live, so you could never have the first moral, which is the choice to live. Like that has to be presupposed as a given, or someone just does it. Um, but this assertoric idea of Roderick is like he sort of takes the Kantian idea of categorical hypothetical, uh, categorical imperatives, and hypothetical imperatives. Categorical is you should do it no matter what, which makes no sense. I agree. And hypothetical, which is always contingent and sort of consequential, it's like if you believe in human suffer, uh, flourishing and human cooperation and peace and prosperity, then you should favor a free market. So it's always contingent. So he says, well, there's a, there's an assertorical hypothetical, which is since then, like since you believe in this, then that. Now, I think that's analogous to the Hoppian argument, which is that since you believe – you've since that you obviously have demonstrated that you believe in peace and cooperation by engaging in argumentation in the first place to solve these problems instead of violence and fighting, what follows from these shared norms that we've, de we, we've identified by this analysis, right? What follows from that is the libertarian superstructure. Of, of norms, which follow from a little bit of logic and honesty and uh, reason and economic analysis applied to the shared norms that we all agree with, um, which is like peace and prosperity and cooperation. Now, if you don't agree, accept these norms, that's fine. And we're, we're used to, but but that that's not really a fundamental problem for us libertarians because. We know of the concept of the criminal or the outlaw, the person that's outside the law that doesn't want to cooperate. So the entire idea appeals to the people that do want to be part of a community of civilized society, right? People that do want to uh, – they do value each other. They have some empathy. They do want to have social cooperation and flourishing, and um, um, they, they wouldn't – disagree with each other on those basic norms. So then the only question is, okay, well then what higher level political norms or interpersonal norms are compatible with norms that we all share? Um, and if there's someone who doesn't agree with that, either they don't agree on the logic that deduces you know, the higher level norms from these, these basic norms, or they don't accept the basic norms. And if you don't accept the basic norms, you're, you're the 
in a sense, you're the same as a lion or a tiger or you know a hurricane to me. You're just a technical, as Hoppe calls it, a technical problem to be dealt with. And that, saw, that, that poses a very small moral issue as well, because, um, you know, I don't face a moral problem dealing with the danger of a polar bear attacking me or a lion or a tiger or a hurricane or a disease. I just have to deal with it as a technical problem. And if someone puts themselves outside of the province of society and law, then that's how you deal with them. And whether humanity can survive or not, given these realities, it's just another contingent technical question. It seems like we have so far for a few thousand years. So apparently it's possible and apparently society makes sense. And so for those of us that want to be civilized and share certain norms, so I think it emerges from that. So the question then would be, why do we have share these certain norms? What are these norms, right? Um, from an ought, from an is statement, I don't think so. But I don't think you need to. That's not the purpose of political philosophy or law. Um, you wouldn't even come to this question if people didn't come together trying to arrange their affairs in a way that we can solve problems. Um, in a, in a way that lets us live together in a mutually cooperative societal way. To be long-winded about it, sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, so so I, think, I think the main point is, or the main contention, I suppose, or, or the, the point for me that, that I'm not really quite getting is like the since part. I get what you're saying that, you know, since we're arguing, you know, you've yeah. already shown that you accept these norms because you're arguing you prefer peace to violence and you know etc but can't can't you take that back to an is because it's like we have scarcity conflictability so we can come into conflict so that's a fact that's an is and the only way we can resolve those conflicts is through argumentation because the very fact that we're talking about this at all right mm. now is that we're engaging mm. in argumentation and so well, doesn't, isn't that an is that precedes that since? Okay, so look, first of all, I was I was just summarizing like Roderick Long's approach and trying to show how even though he dis he probably disagrees with me, um, there's a similarity in this. I think there's a similarity in all these views. Like I don't think there's a um, – I think compa I think consequentialism, uh, not utilitarianism per se, which I think is a subset of consequentialism, but I think consequentialism and deontological or natural rights or principle type ethics are compatible because we're all talking about the same world and they have to dovetail together. So I'm not surprised that they dovetail. Um, observation that I think that the Aristotelian perspective on things, which even Rothbard, excuse me, Rothbard. To a degree shared like Rothbard was a more Aristotelian influenced thinker and even he adopt, uh, endorsed Hoppe's more Kantian influenced approach to things. To my mind this is just – because imagine that there's another ra uh, uh, alien of uh, – another species of, 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 uh, uh, of beings on another planet. And they have a totally different language and concepts. And they, you know, if they if if we meet them or they meet us, you know, we're both we both achieved a certain level of of understanding of the world and the universe and natural laws and morality and interpersonal relationships. Um, so even though we have different languages to describe it, um, we're always talking about the same universe, just like the guys with the elephant. You know, one guy feels the tail, one feels the trunk. They're all talking about the same thing. Um, so I, I think that ultimately, it's it's it, we're describing grapple with the fact of conflict, and only certain people um, want to do that. The people who don't want to do it, you ultimately have to treat them as a problem to be to be solved. Um, so I guess I don't pretend to be a philosopher. Um, I know my limits, 
I, I know what I'm good at and what I'm I'm just an amateur at. Um, my personal opinion, but again, I'm not talking as a philosopher, is that in a way the Hoppian approach is a way it, it is actually a way to bridge the is ought dichotomy. I don't think he would put it that way. Um, I think he just says it avoids the problem. But I do think that Hume was right that you can't logically go from an is to an ought. But the gap is not unbridgeable. You can bridge it by recognizing that there are some primordial or, or primal or, or oughts which are necessarily shared by people that engage in argumentation. So I think that the Hoppian approach, which is based upon you know, some previous discourse ethics work of Habermas and other guys, is more coherent and powerful than, um, than the assertoric hypothetical of, 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 the, of the sort of realistic uh, libertarian Aristotelians like Roderick Long, because they're sort of trying to combine Kantianism and Aristotelianism together, hodgepodge thing. I think it roughly works, but it's sort of an uncomfortable alliance. So I do personally, my personal belief, I don't think it matters that much, which is why I'm, it, I'm saying it. I'll tell you what my opinion is as an amateur, but it doesn't matter that much because in the end, in the end, even if I'm wrong, we still come together as people that have commonly shared values, and we take those for granted. And we build upon them. So we're going to build upon these commonly shared values, and we're going to appeal to them. Like when I make an argument to someone, like this is libertarian. The libertarian argument is to, to a to a normal person who's not a libertarian. You're telling them that look, you're basically libertarian, like I am, because we both believe in peace and prosperity and human cooperation and harmony in society and all this kind of stuff. But don't you understand that the policies that you are in favor of on this side are in conflict with the basic views that we both share? So you're trying just to direct their attention. You're not trying to prove the basic norms. You're trying to direct their attention to the fact that agree with the basic norm that you agree with and that they agree with or that you share. I only say agree with because it's not a truth statement. For peace and prosperity, Preference in a sense, right? So I'm 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 aligning with a group of people that I have some commonality with in basic preferences, a certain division of labor and a certain degree of uh, societal development where you have enough wealth to even entertain these questions and do these things. Really going on, and I think that's what Hoppe is getting at. Education ethics um, idea. He's he is saying that. The, the, if, to understand in a deep way the nature of justification of a norm or a, or a value proposition, right? You have to recognize that that justification there has to be a justification, and that has to be that has to happen through discourse among human beings or or people that are intelligent and that trade ideas and that are trying to use reason to get at the truth. Um, and therefore, this can only happen in a context, and the context is always basically a proto-libertarian context because you can't have a conversation if you don't have the right to use your body and and you're not being coerced to give the right answer, right? So like just that little tiny t – if you admit like a little sliver or a core of normative insight or normative uh, presuppositions – into the idea of normative discourse, you've given up the ghost, and you can't you can't then criticize people like us for having some norms or values that interlace our arguments. Because once you admit one little tiny thing, you you you've admitted this. And this was sort of part of my point that I tried to make against my friend Bob Murphy and 
my ex friend Gene Callahan in our exchange a long time ago when they criticized Hoppe. I said, would you would you concede that there are some things presupposed by the participants in discourse per se? Yes. Are some of those things normative? And there was sort of an uneasy, I think, a rough yes. But once you concede that, okay, then what does that imply? And then I think libertarians can take charge, and we can use our economic reasoning and our consistency and all that to, to you know, to go to to go to level eleven on the dial. But once once you let a little sliver of normativity in, um, I think that we win. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you that ultimately. It doesn't really matter. I mean, because I mean, I, whether or not Hoppe bridged the Isaac gap or sidestepped it or whatever, like I still think the argument is is sound. It's just I thought it was an interesting question about the the philosophical And, and, by, the, and by the way, this, this is uh, so. And this is, I don't mind answering questions about Hoppe, but you know, this is Hoppe's argument. Not it's not exactly mine. I just have been a fan of it. Um, I have my own sort of theory called estoppel, which is kind of based upon it. But it's a whole different framework for the rights. Not different, but it's a different approach, um, which Hoppe uh, endorsed. But so I'm kind of answering what I think the Hoppian would answer um, instead of my own view on rights exactly in this regard. Well, that's a great segue to our next question. And this is one that David has been very excited to ask. So, David, how about you take it on? Yeah, well, um, I wanted I wanted to ask you about your estoppel theory because I, I we brought it up a little bit in one of our earlier episodes, um, but I don't think I explained it quite right. Um, mm -hmm. So, so could you maybe just give a rundown of of what your estoppel theory is and how it's different from argumentation ethics? How it's based on it? What do you think it's doing that argumentation ethics like didn't or, or you know? Can you just kind of give a rundown of of estoppel? Yeah, let me let me try. Uh, so, the, you know, this is interesting because this is um, everything I'm talking about here and that we're talking about. This is pretty high level stuff. So we're already making lots of people tune out or maybe this is your audience. I don't know. This, this, <laughs> this is what we're doing. This, this is, is what we're here for. OK, this is abstruse stuff. Um, so I'll tell you the way I think about it. Um, um, so. I was in law school a long time ago, and I was a libertarian already, and I was a libertarian, I think, looking back on it. And the only reason I'm going to a biography is because I think it helps to frame things to think about how these ideas emerge, right, and how you stumble across them and what attracts you – what attracts you, you to them. Um, and when I read Hoppe's argumentation ethics, I was like… Yeah, that makes sense because here's like an, uh, uh, a really hardcore final defense of rights because the other ones are good, but I, like the Randian, the, the the natural rights arguments, they're all pretty good, but they're all if, – if you see through it, they're all hypothetical, right? And if you have this sense of this is-ought problem, you, know, you kind of have this nagging problem with them. Um, and then – but for me, what the essence of libertarianism is is that, okay, you, you have to conceptually identify what rights are, and you have to um, distinguish it from things like power, which is why the is-ought dichotomy makes sense because Hume is distinguishing – and like even Mises does this a little bit in his works. Like he distinguishes between the way things – are and the way things should be, or the way he puts it, the way you know, possession versus ownership, legal ownership by a system, what you should have or what you ought to have versus what you do have and can have control over, right? Which is why he like can have his whole Robinson Crusoe example, like a you know, a guy or maybe that's Rothbard, I can't remember, but you know. You can imagine economically a guy on alone on an island, and he has possession of resources, and he uses them. 
but there's no norms at all. There's no, there's no, well, I wouldn't say there's no morality because I'm a little bit Randian, but you know, it, it, he's not hurting anyone's rights. He's not hurting anyone else. So if he does anything wrong. Okay, so, um, Sorry, remind me where we were. <laughs> Estoppel. I would just want to ask, oh, yeah. you know, yeah, what's, what's, so, the, so, what's the basic so, argument? So in libertarian, in libertarian thinking, there's basically a symmetry, like a symmetry idea. Like I'm not a pacifist, right? I can use force against you, but only in response to you're using force against me. In, which means initiate. So, like you're the initiator, and I'm a res, I'm a responder, defensive or retaliation or whatever. But the point is, there's a symmetry there, and this is sort of why all the libertarian ideas about defamation law and blackmail and all these other things make sense because even like oh okay so um, if you want to say that you have a right to uh, the copy of your of your movie, you know, file. Okay, and if I violate that, that's fine. But I'm not violating with physical force by, by copying it. So you can retaliate against me, but it has to be proportional and symmetrical. So you could copy mine. Okay, that's fine. But you can't use physical force against me because once you do that, that's disproportionate, and you're you're going from one realm to the other, right? So like there's this sort of symmetry built in. So it, like if I insult you, you can't punch me because I didn't punch you. But if I punch you, you can punch me back. If I use physical force, you can use that. So physical force can only be used in response. So to me, there's this idea of symmetry built into the libertarian um, idea. And so in in law school, I started learning in contract law about this idea of estoppel, which is – it's one of the legal ideas about how contract law has developed. It's it's about how you can um, get out of a contractual obligation. Or, I'm sorry. It's how you can be be bound to a contractual obligation even though you didn't sign the contract. Let's say to be simplistic. Um, and the idea is that if you do something, so the normal idea is that to have a contract to be bound to an obligation, you have to. Have an agreement with another person. You both make certain statements. You exchange certain understandings, um, and then you each give each other some kind of promise of consideration, like a dollar, ten dollars, or or whatever, whatever it's going to be. And um, that makes the contract valid, right? So that's kind of standard contract law. <clears throat> Now, the problem is that would sometimes result in, in, in what people would call inequities. Inequities means an injustice or an unfair result. Um, so, for example, if I showed up at your house, like if, if, if person A calls me to paint his house, and I show up at person B's address on accident, like his next-door neighbor, on accident, and I start painting his house, okay, so… Theoretically, in the law, I'm committing trespass. I'm painting someone's house. Now, probably Pearson, person B wants me to give him a new paint job and do his house. Now, if person B shows up and sees me painting his house, and he realizes, oh, this guy is accidentally painting my house instead of my neighbor's house. He's made a mistake, but I'm going to be quiet about it, let him continue painting, let him finish a job, and then I don't, I don't have to pay him because I don't have a contract with him. Right? I'm going to get something for free. Which the law calls unjust enrichment or whatever. So this doctrine of estoppel would be invoked to say, okay, no, you technically you don't have a contract with the like homeowner B doesn't have a contract with the painter. So the painter couldn't use contract law to sue me to make me pay him. However, if he did sue me. My defense normally would be I don't have a contract, and he hasn't fulfilled his burden of proof. But the doctrine of estoppel would step in and say, well, I'm estopped or prevented from saying that I didn't have a contract because my behavior led him to rely upon the, uh, the understanding that was going on 
and he painted my so like I wake I walked up I waved I'm thinking I'm like I'm gonna scam this guy this guy made a little innocent mistake this is similar to the idea that you have to like mitigate damages like if someone harms you yeah they owe you uh, recompense or restitution but you have a duty to mitigate damages if they do a thousand dollars worth of damages you can't just let the fire rage that they started and say oh it was a hundred thousand now like you have to take reasonable steps to mitigate so there's all these reasonable and that's part of equity law um, which is part of the english common law anyway this is where the idea of estoppel came from so when i was learning about this in contract law it occurred to me well this is sort of the reasoning behind the libertarian idea of symmetry right like um if i harm someone by my voluntary actions and then if they seek to come after me later for damages or for punishment or something like that, then the reason that they can't – that the reason that they have this claim is because I don't have a good defense, and I don't have a good defense because I did the same thing to them. So that's – so I, I would be stopped, and so they would have the right to claim. So to me, that was like the beginning in my mind of an idea of how you could justify libertarian rights. And it's related to Hoppe's thing, but it's it's different in in, in various ways. So anyway, that's my own perspective on it. Um, that's actually how I got close to Hoppe. I I wrote him and uh, I sent him my review essay of his book. Um, in 1994, when I was a young lawyer, with this article uh, uh, reviewing his second big English language book and including ideas for my estoppel stuff and his stuff, and you know, so we became fast friends. So they're related, but they're I would say it's like an extension, yeah, of Hoppe's idea. So basically the argument is that like if you were to commit violence against somebody, if you were to aggress against them, then you can't then say in court that he doesn't have the right to aggress against me for restitution because he did that exact same thing. So then he'd be contradicting himself and the court will stop you because you're going against your prior actions. You're arguing against your prior actions. Exactly. So basically it's relying upon the contradiction there that – um and, and and this whole argument, I think I've come to see, rests upon a really legalistic notion of rights, which I have because I'm a lawyer, and I'm a civil law lawyer because I went to Louisiana. I went to school in Louisiana, uh, uh, law school in Louisiana, which is a civil law state, which has a certain particular way of looking at at these things, um, where. And not all libertarians do this because they're not lawyers or legal scholars or careful thinkers, but legal thinkers. But um, you understand that all rights are correlatives of obligations, right? Now, libertarians recognize this in a rough way when they loosely recognize that positive rights legitimate. They have this innate opposition to positive rights like welfare rights because they kind of recognize that, well, if I have a positive right to receive some kind of assistance or welfare, then the correlative of that – now, they would never use this word, but the, the, the implication of that is that someone else has an ob, a duty to provide it to me. Right. You're, 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 so, you're affirming ownership in yourself, but then you're saying that the other person doesn't have ownership in themselves, that I can extract something from you, but you can't extract something from me, right? Right. And that's more of a, even a Rothbardian point. Like, like communism doesn't work because everyone owns each other, and like, so no one owns anything. So, yeah. But the point is that like these things come into conflict if you start diluting and distorting and muddying up what rights and ownership mean. Um, and and, you, uh, and this is the problem with intellectual property, by the way, and other things, welfare rights and inflation of the money supply. If you think like, oh, if people are poor, let's just print more money. 
well, printing more money makes people more poor because it dilutes the power of money. And if you grant people welfare rights or positive rights, it has to come at the expense of negative rights, right? And so you have this idea, this innate idea among libertarians that they're opposed to positive uh, positive rights because that implies positive obligations. And positive obligations is basically slavery. Now, I will say that one exception to this, in my view, is that if you're a parent or if you do something harmful to some other person, like you have some causal – in other words, I'm not opposed to positive obligations per se, just unchosen ones. Just like I would say that I'm not opposed to uh, transfers of property as long as it's consensual or voluntary, right? But if the government decrees it and no one chose it or was responsible for it coming about, then it's unjust. That's the taking, and that's what intellectual property is, right? So it's like the government telling you – so for example, if, if you own a house and in a, sub, in a subdivision… Which is part of a restrictive covenant, um, you know, community, and everyone's agreed that no one can paint their house uh, an ugly color or use it for a pig farm or something like that. They've all agreed to this what I call a it's called in law negative servitude or a negative easement. So everyone has a a limited property right in each other's property. So every neighbor basically has a partial property. Property of neighbor's house, it's not a right to use it, but it's a right to prevent them from using it in a certain way. And that's perfectly legitimate. The agreement is consensual, right? Which it usually is. But in patent law and copyright law, it's basically an unconsented to negative servitude. That's the problem with it. Just like taxes, like there's nothing wrong with me giving money to you. But if the government makes me give it to you, then it's coerced and it's theft. It might be triangular. I think Rothbard has this uh, taxonomy in his book, uh, Power and Market, uh, triangular uh, intervention or between two people buy, buy something. But um, it doesn't matter. The point is if it's, if it's coerced, if it's theft… Then it's not voluntary and consensual, right? Yeah, and that and that I think that kind of ties into why Rothbard was wrong in Ethics of Liberty about the example with like starving your children or whatever. It's like because of your actions by creating a vulnerable human being that's totally relying on you and can't survive on their own. Like by your actions of procreating, you've assumed an obligation to take care of that individual until they're at the point where they can take care of themselves. Right, it's a voluntarily taken on positive obligation for another person. It's. I, I think I, I mean I personally think that's correct. However, I think in practice he's basically right because, it, just as a human being living on the earth, you know, it's hard to imagine a legal system that's going to impose a duty on a parent to be a good parent. I mean, if you have to be forced to be a good parent. I don't really think you could be a good parent, and probably the kid should be taken away. And you know, however, it could have implications in some in some narrow cases, like uh, you know, if you're Michael Jackson, let's say, and you have you know half a billion, uh, billion dollars, and um, you know you have a child that has some some physical or, or medical problem. Um, I do think that you have I, – I, I think there's an argument to be made that you have a duty to take care of them because what, what's the alternative? It's either society is going to do it through the welfare system, so why should I pay for Michael Jackson's welfare, kids' welfare, right? Or, uh, or the kid is left on his own. Now, in most cases, he can probably be adopt, adopted, but so the, the agreement's a little bit academic. Because it doesn't make that much difference, but I do think, in theory, a parent does acquire obligations to their children because of their actions. So it's not like a normal positive obligation, which the state says we have because we're parts of society and we've agreed, like the social contract nonsense. Like I don't have a right to support my neighbors um, uh, 
uh, with, you know, by paying taxes to make sure that they have a basic guaranteed income. But I actually decided to create this child. <laughs> so there's a difference, I believe. Now, I don't know if a lot of libertarians agree or disagree with me on this, but – and I actually think this could have implications for the abortion argument, um, but that's a hairier question. All right. So in the last answer, you mentioned easements a little bit. Now, Stratty uh, has a question regarding easement studies that he would like to ask. Stratty? Yeah, so I was curious about how easements and use rights would apply to Native Americans. And, uh, you know, what did they own and what reparations are they owed, if any? Mm. That's a good question. Um, I think that's one we don't have a – well, put it this way. Um, I think we kind of all know what the answer is, and we don't like it. Right? <laughs> because it means that basically, you know, there are certain – victimized groups who have a right like basically the blacks and the native americans in the u.s um i think in some cases some people do look earlier on they would have had a claim right because they were the ones who were victimized now it's their kids and it's we're the kids of them and all this um i I, I'm torn between the idea of a statute of limitations idea and just this kind of let the heavens fall idea, like where if the Indians want to claim Manhattan back, they get it back. Uh, now, I think that as a practical matter over time for, for a given person to claim – to make these claims um, – but in theory, I believe that property property rights and, and, and justice claims don't expire. And if you can prove it, then you get it back. Now, as a practical matter, I believe that what would happen in society, given the realities of these past possible claimants cropping up from time to time, would be uh, title insurance uh, practices where – like if I buy a mansion… I want to make sure that if I spend the money to buy it, not just a mansion, but a house anywhere, you know, any piece of property, I want to make sure that uh, no one's going to come after me for it later. And so what you would do is you would hire a title insurance company like people do now, and they would do a search, and they would they would try to figure out who owns it. And if it's unclear, they would try to, you'd have to figure that out, or you wouldn't buy it. You wouldn't risk it. So I think basically – I know a lot of libertarians like some of my friends. I'm not going to mention names, but um, they hate this idea that uh, you can theoretically resurrect old claims to get your property back. But to me, in principle, there should be no limit. If you can make an, a solid claim – now, whether you can translate that to this restitution thing that the, that the, that the African-Americans want to do – I don't think so because that's so generalized at this point. Um, uh, there's no specific victim. There's no specific aggressors alive anymore. So, however, if you if you could if you could find a, a plantation like in Louisiana or somewhere, which which you know is now owned by the direct descendants of the original owner, and the original slaves' kids can come out. Maybe they should get it back. Yeah, I mean, I, I I don't strongly disagree with that, but of course that's not what the restitution is that they're asking for. But in my personal view, there's no theoretical time limit on getting your scarce tangible property back if you can identify it and if you can prove it. It's just that it gets harder over time. It gets really hard to do over time. Now that that, that may not be true in the future. Like that might be true. In our perspective from 2020, looking back 200, 300, 400 years because the records and everything were worse. But if you start from 2020 and you go 200 years forward, um, records are better. Maybe they could prove it. On the other hand, now we have a different type of slavery. We have, we have taxation, 
So then you get into the whole problem of, you know, if we ever achieve libertarian utopia, how do we unwind this thing? What do we do? But the problem with the problem with this whole mentality is that is that there's nothing to give restitution with. Like we're basically bankrupt. There, it's not like there was like you know a zillion bars of gold that had been distributed, and we can just put them back into the owner's pockets. The problem is that lives were destroyed, and there was loss incurred. And it can never be recaptured. Sorry, that's my Hoppa ringtone. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you, I think the like, if if we if we took the if we took over the state tomorrow, the, the state doesn't have enough resources to make restitution to everyone that it's harmed. This is the problem with the state; it causes damage. It it damages lives. So like 99% or 90% has been done. It's gone. It's evaporated. It's like when a company goes bankrupt and every investor gets you know two cents on the dollar, 10 cents on the dollar. So I think that's the best that could ever happen in a real winding up. So it's just impossible to make restitution. If it was possible to make restitution, it would kind of imply that the state is not a problem in the first place because it's actually producing wealth or not destroying wealth, which is not. So, so my view is I'm pro restitution, and I'm pro people being able to get their property back if they can make a claim to it. I just think it's really difficult. Right. And Does that, that make sense? Does yeah, that answer and, your question? And that kind of that kind of ties in with like the in in law like the difference between legal theory but then the application of legal theory because those are kind of two distinct issues right and i think i i heard an interview that you gave with a youtuber gross freiheit tv a german guy i think he talked to you at, at one of the pfs's and that's you talked about how like randy barnett talks about the difference between like legal theory oh, yeah. and then the application of that yeah. legal theory, and that's Ab like an abstract. Important. And yeah, he talks about abstract versus concrete legal principles. Right. That's. I think that's part of it. Um. But I think part of it also is understanding what what law really is. Like, um, there's a weird blend of the the sort of pragmatic consequentialism of a Mises and the way legal systems work and the way we have to theorize about these things. So for example, you know, Mises recognized in socialism, his book, um, the distinction between ownership and possession. And he he recognized that, you know, so you'll you'll get these people that are criti critics of libertarianism. They'll say, like, well, if you're in favor of Lockeanism and homesteading, well, then the whole thing falls apart because you could never you can never prove title of your property i guess back to what adam adam and eve in the garden i mean so like cuz well, they're saying that, that like was, because that was the argument ahead. that that Locke was arguing against i can't remember the the uh, the guy he was responding to when he wrote yeah, treatise on government phil phil uh phil something uh phil or something Filburn? Filburn, yeah, something like that. He was um, trying to trace the title of of the kingship back to Adam, right? Well, I think so. I think what Locke was trying to do was Locke was trying to argue that so so. I think here's what happened: is you had um, you had people d defending the existing regime, right? The elites. Um, so they wanted to defend the monarchical idea. Even the people that were not the monarchs, but they were dependent upon this feudalistic system or whatever. So they had to kind of promote this myth idea that, okay, God gave earth to Adam, and Adam was the first king of the earth, and then everything came from there. So all these guys are emissaries of God, and they're the true owners, and you're all serfs and subsidiaries or whatever. And Locke said, well, God gave the earth to Adam, but most of it was not used. It was in commons, and he gave everyone ownership of themselves, 
and therefore everyone has the right to go use or resource as long as they they, they leave enough and it's good for everyone else, this so-called lock-in proviso. So I think he was trying to come up with a way to bend this biblical religious narrative into a natural rights thing where the monarchs are now – yeah, they have a special place, but they're limited in what they can do. Like they're the guardians of the people rather than their rulers, something like that, you know. Um, so I think that's what he was trying to do, and I don't blame him for that. I think it was brilliant, but part of his argument took some unnecessary detours, in my opinion, um, which I've tried to lay out in some of my talks. Um, and the the main thing I believe, and I think it was a mistake. That he made. Well, I can't say it was a mistake. I see why he did it. I, I think it's wrong, but he basically said, "You own, God gives you ownership of yourself, and therefore you own your labor, and therefore you own these things that God gave to the world in common. If you mix your labor with it, because you know what? Look, this is the typical Lockean argument, and so it's like a convoluted argument to overcome." The, the monarchists, basically, right, and to overcome unlimited government, to come up with some argument for limited government rooted in theological Western ideas, which it, it did do. But then it led to this labor theory of property. Like, So property comes from your labor, so labor is something that you own, and then this led to… Ultimately led to communism and Marx and the labor theory of property. I'm sorry, the labor theory of value, and and then to, and also to intellectual property because you know then you start getting this idea that oh we have property rights and things that's great, and the reason you have a property right is because it's sort of a, kind of a reward or a natural result of your labor which you own or you know it's like this kind of all these metaphorical. Um, vague notions, which most of them correspond with our intuitions about justice and practicality, like the way the world works. You know, like if you work hard, you tend to do better. So people tend to think if you work hard, if you spend your labor on something, you tend to succeed. So over time, when the law starts protecting the foundations of all this, people start thinking, well, Property rights come from your labor and your effort, and if I produce something, I have a right to it. So then you have intellectual property, and you have the whole complete confusion of the law, which I think was spawned by this sort of Lockean defensive maneuver right, against Filmer and um, – yeah, it's Filmer. I think it's Filmer, F-I-L-M-E-R. But what do I know? I'm not a political scientist. This is just my kind of… I, I think I have a good argument for the way libertarian rights have to work and the way scarcity works and the way economics interplays into this and why intellectual property law and all these things are bad and why we claim rights and what it means to claim rights. Um, when you go a second level beyond it and start talking about how it arose, it almost it's, – it's almost like um, – like when you have a friend who's a nut on something, and you know he's a nut, and you can explain why he's a nut. I mean you can explain why his arguments are nutty, but then you start trying to explain why he became a UFO nut or whatever. The, then you're psychologizing. You're, you're trying to explain like a level above like, okay, we're taking for granted this guy's wrong about UFOs or experiences or you know whatever crazy crap he believes. And – but I think it's because his mother abused him when he was young. So, okay, and you might be right. You might be wrong, but you're trying to explain – you're trying to psychologize. You're trying to explain why he was wrong. So I think like some of the stuff you're asking me is like, like that, like, okay, why did we arrive at the current situation, which is obviously wrong? Okay, I think maybe it's because of this or that, and I, I really am not enough of a political scientist. To be confident, to be sure, I'm pretty sure I'm right, but um, just especially because no one else, no one else touches this stuff like 
with an awareness of what's wrong with the current system like uh, like I do. So like I feel like he gives me a little bit of advantage. Like I'm really sure about what's wrong with the current system. So that gives me like um, a, a heightened perspective on, well, maybe how did it come about? But whether I'm right or wrong about that part, it doesn't really matter. The current system is wrong. How it came about is almost irrelevant, but can yeah. be illuminating. Yeah, for sure. So just building a little bit off of of the distinction between you know the abstract legal principles and and the practical ways the legal system enforces it. I just last night I was I was doing some work on a, a law school assignment and I was on Hein on, Online and I saw an old article that you had released with one or two other people I think from like ninety seven or something like that where you talk about the exclusionary rule. Um, and I, I have, oh, yeah. and I haven't read it, but I was just curious, what was your argument in that paper? Because, you know, that kind of gets into that issue of, we have the fourth amendment, which is this abstract principle, but yeah. then the exclusionary rule is the practical way that they try to enforce it. So what were your yeah, kind of arguments I, I, in that paper? Uh, yeah. Which, so here's what's interesting. So I have a book, you can see my picture. I, I have a book coming out probably in about three months. So I'm doing this book. Can you see the picture? Yep. Law in a Libertarian World. Right. So in that book, I'm collecting my essays and things, and I'm actually not including that essay. I think that was by me and Walter Block and Pat Tinsley, if I recall. Um, I'm not including it, not because I disagree with it, because I actually still agree with everything in it. Uh, it just doesn't fit into the sort of theoretical thing, and it's really mired in American constitutional law. Um, the argument in that thing was really narrow, if I recall. Um, it's basically… And I think it doesn't relate too much to the abstract concrete thing. It's more um, the logic, analyzing the logic of the um, – comparing the logic of libertarianism to the logic of what the constitutional say, right? And also appreciating the federal system. So there's lots of things there. So first of all, I don't believe that the Constitution applies to the states at all. Like I'm even way more uh, anti-federalist or whatever the word is uh, than say – or federalist. Than say, say even Tom Woods is like in his nullification. I, I don't think the Constitution – now, as a practical matter, it does bind them now, but the original – The way I look at the Constitution is that it was um, an experimental compact between 13 new states who were all sovereigns, and it was clear that they had the right to leave. And so therefore, if any state so-called violates the Constitution… Then the remedy is that the federal government and the other states can kick them out of the. It's like if you join the Elks Club and you, and you don't come dressed properly, they can they can eject you. If, if Louisiana or whatever didn't abide by the rules, they could be kicked out of the club. But they can't, you can't go to war against them. Like you can't make them stay part of the union. I don't think the federal government has any power. But even if you go with the mainstream view. Um, and if, let's forget about federalism and, and that. The exclusionary rule is the idea that the, the federal constitution and maybe even some state constitutions provide certain rights to people, right? Like the right to not be uh, – um, like the Fourth Amendment. Like you, you can't be invaded. You can't be searched and seized um, unreasonably or without a warrant or whatever, right? So – the exclusionary rule is the idea that um, if if a state criminal court tries to convict you of a crime in court, in criminal court, um, and they want to use ev they have to use evidence against, against you. Now, if they if, if part of the evidence they got came from a an illegal search and seizure, illegal under the Fourth Amendment or the state equivalent thereof, then the exclusionary rule says that uh, the defendant has the right to exclude that evidence. 
Now, as a libertarian who's opposed to most, if not all, state criminal trials, I am actually in favor of the application of and the substance of that rule. But I don't think it actually follows from the Constitution. Like just because the government obtained Ill evidence illegally doesn't mean that they can't use it to convict you. Um, the question for me would be whether it's probative or not. Like probative means whether it's the type of evidence that tends to prove whether you did the crime or not. So if it's a legitimate crime like you know murder or theft or something like that, and the government obtained the evidence by some um, il search that was illegal, then the defendant would have the right to sue the government um, separately for damages for this breach of his civil rights, or maybe it reduces his sentence or something like that. And by the way, half the time it's not even a violation of his rights, it's a violation of some third party's rights, and so it's got nothing to do with the defendant. So we were trying in that article to say that um, the exclusionary rule is not mandated by the Constitution or by libertarian law. So the ultimate issue should be the justice of convicting and, and punishing someone for committing a crime. So then the question is, is it a real crime and that, that they did it? And then what's a proportionate you know, retaliation or response to that. But if someone's actually guilty, then the fact that you got evidence of it by an illegal search and seizure, so that was the argument there. All right. So I think Stratty has a question um, about IP that he'd like to say next. Stratty? Yeah, so... I get into it a lot with uh, people I go to school with about IP and, you know, why I think it should be abolished and why I think it's a bad thing. And the usual rebuttal I get is uh, if I wrote a book or made a movie and someone was to go copy it and then sell it themselves. So I wanted to ask, you know, is it possible to have, um, you know, IP via contract? Like, can you condition the sale of a book on not copying the informational content of the book? Um, let me answer your question. So are you in law school too? I am uh, not. I am considering it, but uh, law is just the uh, interest of mine. Okay. So Dave, Dave is in law school. Yes. That's right. Okay. Interesting. Um, I have several ways of responding to that, that kind of question. Um, number one, I think you can do anything you want with contract. Um, uh, within the bounds of libertarian contract theory. So, yes, so you can, if you want to sell a book to someone and you want to have a contract with them which specifies what they can do with it, um, you can do that. Now, you have to realize that so I, I I've written I have a contract theory article where I I argue against inalienability. I mean argue for inalienability. In other words, I don't think you could sell your body into slavery, um, or I I think that contract cannot be enforceable for various reasons. Um, but even if you could, that wouldn't really affect my analysis that much. But the reason I mention that is because that's ultimately what you what you're saying is that like so we have a contract where so like I sell you a book and I don't want you to use it in certain ways. So before I let, let the book go and take your $5 in payment for the book, I'm going to insist that you what? Make a contract with me what? Not to use it in certain ways? That's fine. And I can see that in certain business arrangements where two companies, you know, have a joint venture and they share technology and they want to keep it secret for a while or whatever. But the nature of a book usually is that it's a thing that's going to be published and be made public. And the purpose of the book is to teach people or for people to learn from it or be influenced by it. Uh, and not only that, most people that buy books are consumers. And they're paying, as I said, $5, $10, $20 for a book. Not a big sum of money. And they're doing it 
for convenience, just to get a little piece of bundle of paper that has some words on it that they can read and enjoy and learn from. So if, if the seller tells them, before you buy this book, you need to sign on the dotted line that you're selling your soul to me. You know, in other words, you have to agree to pay a huge amount of damages if you copy this or give a copy, give it to someone else, or if you make a copy, or if you learn from it and you make a, a you make a sequel because it influenced you or whatever. Most people, I think, that are intelligent and aware of the way the law works, no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to buy a $10 book and obligate myself to potentially millions of dollars of damages if I use it in a way you don't like. I want to like if if you buy a shovel, you know, for your tomato garden and the and the seller wants you to agree on all the ways you can't use it in the future and if you ever use it or sell it to the wrong person, you're going to owe them a million dollars, you'd say screw off. I'm not going to buy the shovel from you. Right, or the contract just wouldn't be enforced um because it's ridiculous uh it's absurd um so I think that you could have a contract in theory, but I think they just wouldn't work but the 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 real point is that even if you did do that, it still wouldn't be i p so intellectual property and this is a legal concept or a legal understanding that makes most people's eyes glaze over, but real quickly, I'll tell you. <clears throat> I'll tell you this. Most people that are proponents of copyright and patent would completely agree with me, and they would oppose – not agree with me, but they, they would oppose um, moving to a contract-based system because they understand, they know that IP is not based upon contract and can't be based on contract um, because IP is – so in the in the in the in the civil law, there's something called an in personam and an in rem right. In rem right is a real property right, good against the world. Like if you own your car or your body or your land, you own that good against the whole world. Even if you, so, you don't have a contract with a guy in Taiwan or a guy in Kansas or a guy six miles down the road, but you still own your car and your property, even though you don't have a contract. So those are called in rem rights or real rights or real property rights. They're not based upon contract. It's based upon the fact that this is a scarce resource that only there can only be one owner to, and the the, the relevant legal jurisdiction has <coughs> excuse me assigned um, an owner to it, and it's not it, it's, it's this person, not someone else. So that's that's the way it works. Um, contract rights. In the law, it's called the law between the parties because and, – and there's there's a concept. Um, you have to have privity of contract for it to be valid. So A and B have a, a sale contract between each other. So if I sell you a book and I and you agree not to use it in a certain way, okay, that's fine. And whether legally – like legal scholars could dispute this. They could say, well, here, how do we view this? Maybe the book is legally co-owned, like this physical book is co-owned. You know, like if you share an apartment with someone, or if you if you co-own a car with your best friend, whatever. Maybe that's the way to look at it, or maybe it's a contract. It doesn't matter. It's still an agreement between the two people, but that agreement only affects them. It's like a closed little legal bubble. It doesn't affect third parties from the outside world perspective. That contract doesn't bind them. Problem. So let's take a novel. I write a novel. I sell it to 10,000 people tomorrow on Amazon. I make Amazon make every one of them sign an agreement saying, I promise never to copy this. Okay, fine. And if I do, I got to pay you a million dollars. Well, first of all, I think they would never agree to that. They would agree to $10 fine, which means one of them will violate it just to spite me, and they pay this $10 fine, and then the book is out there in the comments. But anyway, that. Forget that part. Let's say I have this closed community of 10,000 customers or, or readers or even 100,000, even a million, even 10 million. doesn't matter. They all agree. 
We will buy this book and we won't copy it. Okay. What if one of them cheats and just copies it and scans it and uploads it to the internet anonymously? Now there's this text file up there on the internet in a cloud and everyone can download it. Now all these people that download it, they never agree to any terms of service at all. So they're not subject to an, a, a contract lawsuit from me, the publisher or the author. So there's no IP. So basically contract can be used in some cases like for non-disclosure agreements or for trade secrets, but it can never create IP because IP is an in-rem right. And this is why copyright and patent had to be created by statute. They didn't arise from the common law. They didn't arise from contract law. Um, it's just statutes, you know, the Copyright Act, the Patent Act, which refer back to the statute of Anne in England of 1710 and the statute of monopolies in 23. So these are all artificial decrees by the state and they don't emerge from common law rights or property law rights or contract law and they can't. And this is one mistake Rothbard made when he tried to disentangle copyright patent and all this kind of stuff in the ethics of liberty. He was pretty good on patents, but he he was wrong about the idea that you could use contracts to create a type of IP. But in the end, I would say, yeah, whatever you want to do and can do by contract, go ahead and do it. But it's not intellectual property. And that's not what I'm opposing. Cool. So we're about an hour 16 into this. So, uh, Stefan, do you have time to go maybe another 40, 45 minutes with us? Is that okay? Uh, I can go maybe another 30. Okay. Sounds good. Cool. So we have just, uh, we just have a few, uh, questions left. So maybe just try to, you know, so we can get through them, try to yeah. maybe I'll answer try them to be a quick. little bit. I know I'm yeah. long winded. It's, it's okay. Dangerous. It's okay. We appreciate it. So, um, let's see here. Um, the next question I want to ask you is about Bitcoin and property ownership. I just I rewatched your uh, your PFS lecture from 2019, um, and I really really liked it. I agree I agree with basically your entire framework that that you were working with um, in that lecture. But I guess bef before I get into the main issue, I'll ask you: Are you familiar with um, with Conrad Graf, a legal Austrian theorist? Yeah, I'm actually I know him and I've met him and I've read his stuff and uh, we're friends and uh, yes, I'm very okay. familiar with him. So uh, I read a little bit of his book on on Bitcoin and property ownership, um, and and I'll say that last year in law school I took a class on blockchain and law and I had to write a final paper for that, which I ended up presenting at the Austrian Student Scholars Conference at Grove City College where I met Jeff Herbener and Sean Rittenauer. Um, and basically, I re we, read a, we read a paper for that class where... Both of whom I know and are friends, by the way. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I read a paper for that class by a couple legal theorists named, named Werbach and Cornell, and they released a paper in the Duke Law Journal called Contracts Ex Machina, where they were talking about how smart contracts with like Bitcoin or Ethereum and other blockchains and stuff have posed a problem for for co the traditional contract theory based on promises because there's because the the blockchain smart contracts when the conditions that are set on the computer code are met they automatically transfer so it's like when those conditions are met there's no time period like with a traditional contract the conditions are met and then that creates the obligation for the person to do their end because the other person, mm -hmm. you know, that, but with the, with the smart contracts, it just automatically goes through. So there's right. no time period there between the conditions being met and the, and the person having to perform their duty that just happens. So they were like, this is really tough for traditional contract law because it's kind of taking out the promissory obligation aspect. So I wrote a paper. I was like, "Hey, if we just adopted the title transfer theory, which isn't based on con which isn't based on promises, then this problem just kind of goes away." So I started writing it, but then I saw your lecture where you argued against having property ownership in Bitcoin, and I was just kind of like, "Oh no, this th this might 
kind of destroy my whole theory because the entire contract theory is based on property ownership. And if you can't own these, you know, blockchain assets, mm. then my theory might kind of fall. So what what Graf says in his book is that is that even though you're right that the information on the ledger isn't scarce, it's just mm-hmm. infor- it's mm-hmm. just information. So that can't be property. But he kind of argues that there's still a, a conflictable there, there's still an aspect of conflictability right. to the information because if one person were to guess the public private key or whatever and then take that Bitcoin, then then it's not like taking an idea of, out of somebody's heads because if, if you get an idea from somebody, they still have the original person still has that idea in their head. But with the with the blockchain Bitcoin or whatever, they they can't manipulate the ledger information in the same way that they would be able to before. So there was kind of still a conflictability aspect there. So that's what I yeah. put. That's what I put in my paper. Because I thought that I just kind of had to argue for that in order to save my entire thesis. So I just wanted to ask you, what's your kind of response to that argument that there still might be a conflictability aspect to the ability to manipulate the the ledger information, and that might, you know, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I do, and uh, I haven't. I, 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 I'm not sure if I'm recalling Conrad's argument exactly. I think I didn't agree with all of it, and he has a he has a somewhat different way of putting this whole thing and he uses way more uh he uses more metaphorical terms than i would as a lawyer and he also uh he tries to be precise but he also uh engages in equivocation not on purpose but because a lot of people take for granted these legal concepts i mean honestly i this, if I could do anything in my – not in my life, but like in my next intellectual evolution, it might be to expand upon Bam Bavark. Uh, he's got this – I think it's his second chapter in his uh, economic uh, – the book about uh, – Bam Bavark's uh, things about a, a, a legal, legal, legal concepts as economic goods or something like that. I think that's where you have to start looking, and I think that unlocks the key to understanding this. The problem is this would take this would take hours, and I even have, I haven't even figured all this out yet. But the, what what I really think roughly is this: um, yes, the the promise theory of contract leads you. So this is like legal positivism, like like if you take the existing actual legal system and w- the way they treat contracts. It does create problems when new things emerge. That's because they're not sound in the first place. Uh, and I think Rothbard and Evers are basically correct, even though neither were legal theorists or legal specialists or lawyers. Um, so promising can't be the basis of that. And the concept of property, which is also the basis of contract law <clears throat> in either system, the title transfer system or the promising system, um, property is not based upon um, – so there's a distinction between economic resources and between resources that are protected by property rights. So we tend to, we tend to conflate those things, right? And I think there's a little bit of that going on there in all these arguments. Um, um, I'm just going to mention a few things because I want to. I don't want to keep belabor. So, for, you mentioned this like smart contracts idea. So, I'm a Bitcoin enthusiast. I'm pessimistic because I'm a pessimist in general. I think the state will kill it. Maybe I don't know. Uh, I think it makes sense economically and is the inevitable future of humanity whenever we finally emerge from this primitive age that we're in. Um, but. I am totally skeptical of the idea of smart contracts uh, for several reasons. Um, I mean, the the primitive version of a smart contract is a vending machine, like like a Coca Cola machine or a candy machine, right? It, it's a vending. I mean, the word "vend" means to sell, right? To, to to sell something. It's got an automatic construction of rules that, and that works for certain simple contemporaneous transactions, right? Most contracts are not that simple. They're not that contemporaneous. And most contracts 
involve a liability of one party to the other, which they don't have the ability to pay at the inception of the contract. Like most contracts have a, a sort of a credit or debt aspect to them, um, or risk aspect from the other side, you could say. Um, and so when Roth, even Rothbard and these other guys, when they talk, when they imagine contracts always have um, you deposit the funds with some third party escrow agent. Um, that just can't work. Most contracts, the, the guy that needs the extension of credit, in effect, the reason he needs it is he doesn't have the funds right now. He doesn't even always have collateral. It's just, it's a risk by the other side, you know, the creditor. Um, and so you could. I would say 99% of contracts, except for contemporaneous ones, like when I buy a Hershey bar or a, a newspaper, um, they, they, they could never be backed by security, you know, what do you call it in law school, uh, security devices or security or mortgages or, or security interests. You can't do it because there's nothing to secure. And so there is never going to be an escrow agent that was going to have – all the money you need to back it up. I mean, just think about Bitcoin, even Bitcoin contracts. Bitcoin is so volatile right now. If you want to use Bitcoin to make a loan and you want to have the Bitcoin as a collateral, I mean, what would you, as a lender or as a creditor, what I would you? Crush the anti fascist mob. Crush the anti fascist mob. <laughs> yeah, that's my hop over right now. <laughs> So, I mean, what you know, if someone wants to borrow a hundred thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin from me, no, sorry, other way around. But whatever, if I want to, if I want to borrow that much money and I want to use my Bitcoin as collateral, I would probably have to pledge ten times or five times that amount as collateral, and I, I might not even have that. So, this whole idea, I think, is is is, is ridiculous. Um, so. I, so I'm a. I think the idea of smart contracts, and, and plus I think smart contracts require artificial intelligence. And look, I've been a lawyer for 25, 30 years now, and I've been trying to automate my contract, you know, templates the whole time, and no one does this. It's not going to be done. I mean, you you can't have some. There's no AI. AI is not even around. It never will be, or not for a long time. Who's going to interpret these things? So these these automatic contracts, I think, are like a pipe dream. Like they're only like one percent of all contracts. Now I could be uh, just lacking vision, so maybe I could be wrong about that because I am a Bitcoin, Bitcoin enthusiast. I'm oh, sorry. So, but I was I'm I'm, I'm uh, getting around. What was the main issue? Oh, scarcity. Oh, so yeah. here's the issue about scarce, scarce scarcity in Bitcoin. Um, no, sorry. Let me let me you steer me back on the course because I've lost track here. Just the question is with the IP stuff, if you take an idea from somebody's head, they still have it, so there's no scarcity there. But with a Bitcoin, if you take oh, yeah, it, then yeah, they yeah, can't yeah. manipulate yeah. the ledger to the same extent that they used to be. So there's a conflict of right. There. Okay, right, right. Right. So let's just think in concrete terms. For me to take an idea from someone's head, there's only like two two or so conceivable ways to do it. Number one they tell me, or number two, you know, I use some strange device to extract the information from their brains. And that either involves coercion or torture or something peaceful. I don't know. But the point is, in every case, you can handle this issue with regular, with regular law. Like if I coerce you, you know, if I, if I put a gun to your head and say, give me the code, or give me your information, then I've committed coercion and I'm guilty of that. And then there's consequential damages and all that. Um, guess it. I guess it's okay. But I mean, who who can guess what's in your your head? And there's no technology to do that, right? So for Bitcoin, I don't think there. So I think the the concept of ledger is a concept that we use to describe metaphorically what this system is that we find useful um but there is no such thing as a ledger ontologically like there's no physical ledger that some ledger that someone owns so i just personally think from my understanding of this i'm talking to lots of bitcoin people 
I don't pretend to be a Bitcoin expert. I'm just an enthusiast and a, I roughly understand how it works. Um, the ledger is just a set of data that correlates encryption keys with each other with a limited set of entries on um, you know, uh, the blockchain. And that data is just so it's just data and it's stored on people's computers. So to my mind, as a lawyer and as a libertarian lawyer, um, the answer from a legal point of view is solved by identifying that part. So people own their computers. They own their hard drives. So all these people around the world that have computers with hard drives – that are storing copies of the blockchain, which is the ledger, right? And it's there's 10,000 or 100,000 of them, whatever it is, and they're synchronized every 10 sec, every 10 minutes. Um, this is just a set of data, and you don't, no one owns that data, and therefore no one. So I don't think that the, uh, a, I don't think a Bitcoin or a Satoshi is a conflictable. And I like how you use that word. That's that's one of my my ways of trying to avoid the the confusion that arises when you re, when you use the word scarcity, which is an ambiguous term. Then people will say, "Oh, well, good ideas are scarce." You know, it's like, no, we don't mean rare. We mean there could be conflict over them. I don't think there could be conflict over a Bitcoin because a Bitcoin is not a thing that exists. It's just the conceptual way that we categorize and, and think about the way this ledger represents itself. But it's just a, a set of data stored on people's hard drives. And so then the question is, who owns the hard drives? And the answer is they do. So there's no way you can have a uh, you can have ownership of a Bitcoin in the legal sense. So the problem is that people use the word ownership in dual senses. They use it in the practical sense of the ability to control and as a practical matter like you know it's like if you have a password to get into a special nightclub the guy might let you in gives you the ability to get into the club doesn't mean you own the nightclub right if you have your encryption your private your private encryption key to transfer some bitcoin entries on the blockchain from a to b from you to someone else you have the practical ability to transfer it, and that gives you the ability to use that power to insist that someone pay you or get, do something you want them to do. So you can use that in economic exchange. But legally speaking, I would say that you don't own Bitcoin, and you can't own Bitcoin. So the concept of ownership I would restrict in a technical sense to… The legal right to control a resource, but since bitcoins are not a resource, they're just the they're just information stored on people's resources that are owned by them. You can't own that because they own that. I guess that's my answer. I've been really interested in how Austrian economics applies to legal theory, um, and I know that in the title transfer theory, Rothbard talks about the idea of implicit theft. So, you know, if if you don't meet the con the conditions of the contract, but you have possession of the other person's property, then you have possession without the title. So therefore, mm -hmm. you're a thief. So under that contract, you could sue for restitution to get your property back. But also, I was wondering how the idea of time preference might come in to getting um, payment and restitution for the for the loss use of your property because there was time where you were deprived of your possession of it and my thought was that like well if you couldn't sue to get some kind of you know recompense for the lost use the the lost possession then you might be a, you might fall into like the kind of like the socialist arguments of like well you're not using your land and because you weren't going to be able to use it then you know absentee ownership or whatever that that they don't like and so i thought that you know, mm. even if you're not even if you're not using something or you wouldn't have used something that was implicitly stolen from you, you know, I think we still need to have some some way to to pay restitution for that because if we don't, 
then we're kind of falling victim to the idea of, well, you weren't going to use it anyway. And first of all, how do we even know that? The future's uncertain. We don't know whether or not they would have used it. Do you kind of see what I'm thinking there? So do you think that the idea of time preference could justify paying restitution for not only giving the property back in an implicit theft case, but also getting payment for lost use of that property? Whew. That's like five <laughs> questions packed into one. Let, let me let me try to take them a, a little bit one at a time, and you can okay. stop me for elaboration. Um, the one I disagree with is the time preference idea. Um, uh, I think that Austrian economic and economic thinking in general can um, is essential and can help illuminate um, these these legal kind of issues. But the one that I, I'm not sure really helps. I mean, I find it fascinating. But um, so I agree with. The, so here, here's the way I look at it: all property. Let's start from the basics. All rights are human rights because we're all, there's only humans as far as we know, and all human rights are individual rights. They're rights held by individuals, not states or groups, and all individual rights property rights or rights to legal rights to control scarce resources. They have to be because rights are enforceable aspects. So like there's this kind of symmetry it just builds from there. Um, and then contract law comes out of that. So contract law is the owner of a resource. Like that's what property law is. It identifies the owner of a resource based upon certain like first owner contract you know so contract is the transfer of ownership from a to b so that's why the title transfer theory rothbard makes sense okay now based upon all that then you think about what's the non-aggression principle yeah so when lefties and other people say oh if someone walks across your lawn they're not committing aggression like i agree but the non-aggression principle is like a shorthand description of the basis of our rules of property assignment, right? So the core rule is what some people say self-ownership, even I have, but I think it's confusing. It's you own your body, like who owns your body? So you're a human actor with a body in the world and you own it. And when someone physically punches you or hits you, that's aggression, and so the rule that we say is you can't do that, which recognizes that there's a scarce resource, the body that someone owns, etc. And then we extend that to other resources that we use in the world, and we so we use the non-aggression principle to extend there. So it's an unfair criticism to say that it's not aggression to walk on someone's lawn because you're using their property because it's like the reason that we say that you can't use their properties because it's an extension of the body owning rules right now once you get this basic libertarian idea you understand that when you use someone's resource that they own which includes their body or something else that they've homesteaded or bought by contract from someone else when you use that without their consent with their permission, right? Um, we call that aggression, call it whatever you want, but the point is you have violated their rights. And then and then they owe some kind of or you're entitled to some kind of response because they can't complain because of estoppel. Now, but that's limited by bounds of proportionality for obvious reasons. And therefore, you can use that right to respond to exact from them in negotiation some kind of restitution payment so that's where restitution comes from right now the time preference thing you mentioned sure i guess that you could incorporate into this analysis the fact that things now are more valuable than they are in the future just like you could incorporate into the analysis um the fact that if you steal my blank notebook my, my blank notebook from my home 
it doesn't hurt me as much as if you steal my notebook containing my my unpublished manuscripts of my novel, right? Um, so they're physically the same thing, but they have different consequential damages to me, different consequences to me. So there's different consequential damages. So once you identify the act of aggression or trespass or force that violates someone's property rights, then the consequences of that come into play. And you and that's the only point where I think time preference would, would weigh into the matter. Um, as for the others, um, I think Austrian theory, specifically Mises and his praxeology, which a lot of people roll their eyes at or don't understand, or they think the word is just an unnecessary word that's made up, is is essential to understanding all this stuff. Um, I used it in identifying causation theory, like how you decide who's responsible for a crime or an action, negligence, tort, whatever, because you have to think of humans as actors who employ scarce resources or means to achieve certain ends. And that's what, like the crime of murder, for example, is basically ending their life by an action, right? So. You know, if I pray that someone dies and they die, I don't think I'm guilty of murder. I might be a horrible person, but I didn't cause them to die because there's no causal link. There's no means there. Right? Or if I, you know, if I don't cause someone to die, but I tried to, that's also not murder. It might be attempted murder, but it's not murder. So like that can help there. And I have a whole article on that, which will be in my book. On the idea of implicit theft, uh, that's one that's one thing I think Rothbard was a little bit uh, shaky on. Um, like in his contract theory chapter in Ethics of Liberty, he talks about implicit theft, and Walter Block, his his student, does that too. And Walter and I are friends, and we've argued about this. Um, I do believe there's such a thing as implicit contracts. But I don't think there's such a thing as implicit theft um, because when you say implicit theft, it's never clear what the owned item is and where the act of theft is. So, for example, if I if I loan you $1,000 and you don't pay me back in a year, $1,100, did I… Rothbard and Block would call that implicit theft, and therefore, theoretically, debtor's prison would be justified. But then Rothbard backs off on that, and he says, well, that would be disproportionate. So he he knows that that's too far, so he goes too far with his theory. But the question for me is like, well, then what's what's implicit theft? Like did did someone steal $1,100 from me? That they owed me in a year, or did they steal the original one thousand? And I, and Walter gave me both answers. He says, "Oh, he stole the uh, eleven hundred. I said, "But he doesn't have it. He's broke. Because if he's not bankrupt, he then I own the eleven hundred. Like I own it, and I just have to go reclaim it." He says, "No. Well, he stole. It. He says, okay, you're right. You can't steal something that doesn't exist. Like if someone's penniless or they're dead." How can they steal it? So it can't be the future one eleven hundred that's owed. So then he says, "Oh, okay. Well, then they stole the original one thousand. I said, "So one year later, we determined that retroactively in past time, what we both thought was a consensual transaction was actually theft. You see, that doesn't make any sense either because the whole purpose of property rights is to allocate. Who can do what with things right now? You always have to know in principle right now. Not only that, when someone loans money to someone else, the whole purpose is that they can go spend it to fund their enterprise or whatever they want to borrow their money for. But if they can't – to spend it, they have to own it. And so the, the title transfer of the $1,000 that was lent is unconditional. It's unconditional. So there's no theft there either. It's 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 related in that there's a 
is that there's another transfer, but the other transfer is a future transfer. Like I give you 1,000 now, 100% unconditionally, so that you can spend it. But in return, in exchange, the only reason I'm giving you this is because you're giving me $1,000 in the future. I mean, sorry, $1,100 in the future. But we both know that that's conditional and uncertain because the future is uncertain. And so when that future day arrives, if the 1100 is there, yes, I now own it. But if it doesn't, it doesn't transfer because there's nothing to transfer, so there's no theft. So the implicit theft idea to me is problematic and actually inconsistent with Rothbard's title transfer contract. So like Rothbard came up with a brilliant title transfer theory of contract, but he didn't, you know, he didn't follow it all the way to its end. I think we've gone over the, the half hour that you said, but we still have one question left. Can you take it? Or I, yeah, I have a few go? more minutes. Go ahead. All go right. Ahead. Stratty, you want to ask our last question? Yeah. So we started this podcast because it was my idea that we need more libertarian people in the legal world. So I wanted to ask, you know, what's the state of libertarianism in the legal profession? What legal position, what legal positions would you suggest libertarians get involved in? And what other advice do you have for young libertarians thinking about law school? Oh, that's another interesting. You guys are good at this. You you pack three questions into one. <laughs> um, I think the first question. Um, I mean, I would say it's still nil. So libertarianism is is not that widely known or respected or sympathized with by the legal profession. However, it's probably way more well known now than it was 15, 20 years ago. Um, I think by now people know what libertarian means at least. I think usually, although you know, you still hear people conflate it with conservatism or whatever. Uh, it, there's been some progress because there's just so many more libertarians now. Uh, as for I love law school and I love loved it, but I'm not normal and not everyone's normal. So law is analytical and it's practical and it's I think in the sense that you have to say forget your skills, but you have to realize that Paying you for that kind of stuff usually, you know, navigate the legal system and solve problems. Now, you can, the, luckily, society is developed enough and we're rich enough and we're big enough where we have a big enough legal system where if you want to avoid doing things that are obviously unethical, you can do that. Like, you don't have to be a a prosecutor for the DA. You don't have to be um, an IRS attorney, you know, whatever. Uh, there's lots of things you can do that are totally morally clean, I think, um, luckily, still in this country. Probably wasn't that way in, you know, Soviet Russia or East Germany during communism or whatever. You pretty much had to be corrupt to, to do it. Um, as, like, even as a patent lawyer, even if someone opposed to patent law, um, I could come up with justifications for being an aggressive guy who defends people suing people for patents, even though I'm opposed to it. But I, I just chose not to do that. But I was I was I had the luxury of doing that, and partly because I steered my career in that way. So, as a practical matter, I think law school can still be a good career, but I would say. A couple things. As a, this is just me as a lawyer, not as a libertarian. Um, number one, only go to law school if you either love it or you think you can do well, right? Like you have a, a deep passion for it, and you're going to do it no matter what, or you or you think you'll do well. To do well, I think you need to number one be smart, 
go to law, go to a good law school. I don't mean some podunk law school. Go to a good law school. Do well, like be in the top one fourth of your class, right? And be willing to work your ass off for the first seven or so years of your career, which is fun if you're young and ambitious. Um, at a at a at a, at a medium or big size law firm or some kind of some kind of career that gives you good experience, you know. Um, and as for the fields you should choose, I would try not to choose a field that is a boilerplate uh, uh, field that the dumb ones can. I don't want to say that it's going to piss me. Well, immigration law or whatever. I mean, immigration law is a fine little specialty, but anyone can do it. Plaintiff's law is fine. Some people make lots of money, but it's luck of the draw. Uh, so the fields that I think, but some of these are just my personal interest, but like I would say tax law, get an LLM in tax law, uh, corporate law, securities law, mergers law, M&A law, mergers and acquisitions, high level stuff at New, in New York, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, some types of IP law can be good. Um, maritime law, if you live in the South or anywhere near a port, certain places where they do maritime law. So like there are specialties you can do that set you apart and that are not something every grunt can do, but you can make a decent amount of money at it if you're if you're good. Um, and then there's other advice I have too about law school, but uh, that's a whole different topic. All right. Thank you so much, Stefan, for taking the time today. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you thank very you much. I enjoyed it. You guys take care. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the Law of Liberty podcast. And we'll see you next time.